Right, let's begin then. Uh, today uh, on LinkedIn Live, we're going to be talking about fixing your online forms and checkouts. It's about identifying and fixing the biggest issues that you might find that are causing people to abandon. A couple of notes before we get started. Um, if you have any comments or questions, just feel free to drop them in the comments straight away. It's on LinkedIn, so there's a little bit of a delay, so it's best if you just put them in and I'll pick them up when I can, when I go through, uh, either at the end or, or going through it while we do it. So just do that. Uh, I will also be circulating this video uh, to anyone who's signed up uh, to the, uh, the end, so don't need to take too many notes. And of course, if you have any questions at all about it afterwards, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. But <clears throat> let's begin. Uh, so first up, important question. Um, why should you listen to me about forms? Um, well, for those of you that don't know, uh, Zuko is a form analytics product which is designed to surface, identify and help fix any UX issues on your forms that are costing you customers money, leads, whatever it may be, just to really identify them using data. And we've been doing it for about 10 years or so. So we've seen pretty much every faux pas on a form that you might expect to see, although we occasionally see new ones uh, come to us, which, are, which is always good to see. Um, and so we know a lot about forms, so that's why we're sharing our knowledge here. But today, as I say, it's all about what should you be looking at to fix your forms. Now, theoretically, that there are thousands of reasons why your customers are dropping out of your form or checkout um, because of the form experience. Could be, you know, examples here, you know, terrible captures, big long drop downs, horrible messaging, etc., and, and you know, hundreds and thousands more. But what I wanted to do today was really focus in on the core ones that we commonly see. And these fall into four areas, typically. So one is broken stuff that doesn't work. The next one is about the user expectations and user confusion. The third area is around errors and validation and what you're telling them. And the final thing is about what you're asking. Are you asking for things? in a strange way, asking for things that people don't want to give you, that sort of thing. So we'll go through these areas one by one, talking about them. It's going to be fairly brisk. This is a you know a short video workshop, so hopefully you'll get the idea, but you can always ask more questions if you have them. So looking at the first one first, broken stuff. So things that are, you know, they, they, these you know, typically are seen as things that just don't work the way they should. Um, you know, this is a you know, fairly basic. If something isn't working, in theory, you should be able to identify it pretty quickly and you should be able to get your development team to fix it. So this could just be things, elements that just don't work, buttons that might uh, just do nothing and go nowhere uh, is, is a classic example. But there might be a little, little more. We've got on the screen here, we've got almost a new button. And what this does is when you click the register now button, if you've not got the form filled out perfectly, then it takes out all the data that's on the form, removes it. So you've got to start again rather than just looking in this case at the phone number, which had not been entered and the terms and conditions which hadn't been ticked. Obviously, if you have something like this, it's going to be costing you business. It's something you can identify and fix quickly. So the, these are all things that all the things I'm going to talk about today. You should have a look at your own forms, see if they're appearing, because it's a very quick way of, of seeing if there's anything clearly obvious. Obviously, for anything else, you can add products like Zuko uh, as well if you want to, to understand more and find uh, additional issues. So other broken things that you might see, uh, example here, placeholders. You can see someone's typing in information, but the placeholder is staying there. They can't see what they've entered. It only goes away when they move on. Not ideal. So that's a clear UX break that you need to fix. Other examples, we've got, you know, when you, you test, you've got to test out your errors as well as your interaction. So we've got an example on the left where multiple errors are being put out at once and you can see overlaying each other, complete mess. Uh, the second one is essentially even when someone fixes the error, the error message is persisting. And we see this, you know, it's quite common. It, you, you, you might be good at showing them errors, but make sure they're removed when it's finished to so fix your validation from that front. However, it's not just the obvious broken stuff that's broken. It's stuff that seems to be broken to the user. You may not think it's broken because you've designed it that way, but the user might think it's broken. So classic example on the left, a disabled button uh, where it's grayed out until they've, they've filled in the form correctly. Uh, very common users 
you know, miss something, they're not sure what's going on, you'll see them hammering on the disable button. Uh, they just feel it's broken, bad experience, might lose them um, rather than guiding them to where they need to be. The good thing, if, if a button's disabled and they click on it, typically that will trigger error messages, which if it's disabled, they may never know what the problem is. So that's one example. Second example is validation on the right. So if you're overstricting your validation, so you can see here someone's typing in their mobile telephone number on this form, they think it's right because they're putting spaces in, that's the way they've typed the telephone, uh, or they're putting dashes in, that's the way they do it. They think it's right, but your form thinks it's wrong, kicks it out, doesn't really tell them, it just says ask for a valid phone number. Well, how do they know there's no space, that you don't accept spaces? Really, you should be accepting it. Your validation is too strict, or at the very least, you should be telling them exactly what's necessary. They can't include spaces. So look at the other things that the user might perceive to be broken, not just the clearly broken stuff. Final thing on this area is also, uh, again, not classic break, but make sure you're using the correct HTML type for each field. So for telephone number, use HTML type tell when you create the field. Uh, the reason for this is it means that the most appropriate um, uh, keyboard will appear uh, for the user when they click on the box. So on the left-hand side for a phone number, you're getting a clear phone number field with, with digits that they can tap on with a big fat finger, nice big spaces they can do, uh, rather than it being text and they have to try and click through and use the small one, two, three keyboard uh, as well. So make sure you're doing that because that's essentially is like a break. And it's something very simple we see all the time and it's very easy to fix. The next area, as I said, is around managing the user expectations and avoiding any confusion. So some examples here, and these are tend to be positive examples that I'm gonna show you now. First one is <clears throat> you need to check if you're, you're telling people that they need certain information. So as an example, this is the UK government form and it's very good at telling people what they need up front before they start on the form journey. They're asking about national insurance number, taxpayer reference. Things that are slightly complex, you'll see this happen with driver's license, passport number as well. Um, if you don't tell people what they need, you'll find they go part way through the form. You ask them for the information, they swear, they get up, they go away, try and find it. They may never come back or they might be timed out depending on your form. You'll lose them. Whereas if you tell them up front, they've got plenty of time to get the information together. They'll start the form, they'll complete it much, much quicker. So always check. You're asking for something that's not an easy answer for them. Tell them up front so they can they can be prepared. Similar to that is also uh, when you're asking them even stuff that you think might be completely clear. Are you making it clear? So the example here we've got is uh, around billing information. Make sure that you're making it clear that it's the billing address associated with your credit card. Often you'll see in e-commerce people will put in the wrong address. They'll put the home address when it should be a business address. Uh, or some other thing that causes problems. So if you've got a dynamic like that, use microcopy to basically make the information completely clear um, as to what you're, you're, you're looking at uh, there as well. Passwords are another common uh, source of, of problems. We've all been on a form, we typed a password in, it says, no, invalid, we won't accept it. Well, why I didn't know what you wanted. You're only telling me this after I've entered my preferred password. If you're telling people up front what the password stipulations are, you're gonna find they have a much smoother experience when they enter it. So be clear if you're doing that or anything similar, what the stipulations, what the validation is, similar to the phone number stuff we talked about earlier. And importantly, do you tell them why you're asking for it? You know, we see so many times that People drop off on the phone number field uh, and just adding a little bit of copy telling people why you're asking this uh, decreases dropout significantly. And, and here's a great example. So it's it's for an e-commerce provider. Um, and, you know, why do you need someone's phone number for e-commerce? You've got my address. You've got my email. You don't need my phone number. You're just going to spam me with sales calls, aren't you? Well, no, because what we said here is we're only going to use this if we if, uh, to contact you about your order. So there's a great bit of reassurance. Someone like, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. I will give you, you know, my phone number. You have to earn those pieces of information if you need it. So always tell people why you're asking for anything that might be seem suspicious or, or 
not normal to the user. Microcopy is a great way uh, to, to, to manage that. So the next area to talk around is errors and validation. It's a big error, a big uh, issue. Every form, someone's going to make an error at some point on the form. Uh, so are you doing things right? Uh, so have a look out for some of the things I'm talking about and see if they are occurring on your form. First thing is about the helpfulness of error messages. Um, always make sure your error messages are helpful. You can see on the left hand side, very bland or almost accusatory um, error messages. There are validation errors. What, which ones? What do they do? I don't know. How do I fix this? On the right hand side, there's a little bit more, you know, on the top right, they're talking about include an at in the in the uh, email address, give them a hint what's what's wrong. Or in, in the case of the, the one on the bottom right, even further, it's like, okay, you put in hot nail, do you actually mean hot mail? Those sort of errors, the, the management are much better and they'll reduce stress during uh, the user journey through your form. So make sure you're being helpful and not bland or, or, or just meaningless. I talked about the language just there. Here's, here's some good examples. So don't be accusatory. If you look at the examples on the left, you 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 didn't enter a name. You um, good better example is please enter your name. You, you left this blank. Or, and again, you can build in if you've got a brand which is friendly, cheeky. You can add a bit of extra copy in there, which kind of helps to build build your brand as well. Um, so make sure you're being friendly and useful um, and not accusatory or angry because um, it won't go down well. In terms of the validation, are you triggering too early? Premature error ejaculation, as it seems to be known in the trade nowadays. Um, basically, you can see this example on the screen. Um, you can see that as soon as someone starts typing in to this particular question, they're being told to enter a valid email. It looks like they made an error. But hey, I've only just started. Leave it, leave off. You should not be validating then. You should be validating when the person moves on. It's a you know fairly common error, and it's one that's annoying for people. Or are you doing it too late? You know, you're only telling them when they've, they've gone 10 pages down and then you see the example here. It's There's an error message, but it's right later on. Well, well what's this referring to? Please answer this question. I'll go, well, hey, I don't know, it's too late. I mean, it's, it's five five questions up. It's annoying again. Um, tell them uh, at the most appropriate time, which is typically when they move on to the next question. And, and also be clear, as we, we talked about, here's an example. Uh, someone's putting all the error messages at the top of the form, the submit buttons at the bottom. They don't know where it is. They've got to pogo back up and down to the top of the form to see what the issue is. Then they've got to go down and say, well, where was that? Because it's not absolutely clear. I'm going to try and fix it. So you can see when you have validation like this, it's, it's a nightmare. You're better off using inline validation, which triggers immediately after someone uh, completes a field. You know, I mentioned inline validation. Here it is. As well as the, the negative error messages, um, you know, use positive ones as well. Um, and that is valuable. There's, there's, there's plenty of studies that show you know, the green tick can work wonders in terms of reducing stress on a journey, reduces uncertainty. They know they're not going to have any errors when they get to the submit button. So that's valuable as well. Uh, we really recommend it. And I think you'll be surprised when you, if you implement that to, to see the effect that it has. Um, Final area is about the questions that you ask, asking for things that people don't want to give and not giving you information. That, um, so, you know, classic example we always see, and I've, I've talked about it earlier in, in this uh, session, is do you need to ask for phone number? What you can see on screen here is Zuko data. So we basically did an analysis of all the common uh, fields and looking at their abandonment rates. So basically, if you're looking at the abandonment rate column here, I mean, you can see where people are abandoning the most. Typically, password is always a big one, um, but you know, often you, including a password is is unavoidable. Uh, email again, and also phone number. And phone number is one that um, say so people jump out on it because they don't expect it. They're not asking for it. So always with phone number, always ask yourself, do I need this phone number? What am I going to do with it? Uh, and either remove it or add some of the micro copy that we looked at before. So be clear, are you asking for phone number? Because sometimes we see forms that for, for businesses that don't actually need the phone number and they cause people to drop out when they don't need that information anyway. So make sure you're really thinking about whether you need the phone number. Other thing, which is not so much about what you ask for, it's where you ask for it. Um, 
if you're an e-commerce provider, where are you putting your coupon codes? Um, now, you'll see in this example, it's just immediately above payment. And we've seen time and time again, if you do that, then what you'll find as a behavior is you'll find people spending a lot of time going off trying to search for a coupon code because it, because the, 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 the field is there, they feel there need, must be a code somewhere. So you'll see them bouncing off and about um, and often they don't come back because we've all been to coupon sites recently. You know, 90% of them don't work. So people are putting in, they're getting feel bad for um, uh, messages that, you know, you, this isn't valid. You're going back and eventually they give up and you're losing out on business. We, we see that it's much more successful. You hide it or put it somewhere else in the flow because uh, people are less likely to bump out. And, and we see this pattern, and particularly on mobile, the dropout rates are pretty high for, for fields like this. So make sure you're thinking, what do you do with this? Do you do you hide it? Uh, or we've got, we've got written lots of articles on this, which give you other alternatives. And uh, kind of winding up, you know, are, are you scaring them off by asking personal questions with no explanation? Uh, the first example on here is business name which is basically your employer name often uh, that, that people ask for employers. And uh, we see this, if you ask for someone's employer uh, without putting information as to why you're asking for it, people are really scared and they often drop out because they think you're gonna, if you're employ, um, asking for a loan or something like that, they think you're gonna be straight on the phone to, to their employer asking about them, causing trouble, possibly costing them the jobs. Um, so you'll see people dropping out. So that's why you kind of need to add some information. You can see on the right hand side of this particular one, uh, it talks about this is for regulatory purposes only. Uh, we will not contact your employer. And that second bit is really important. We what? It's not what you are using it for, it's what you're not using it for. You will not contact my employer. That's the worry. So you need to include microcopy there. Um, Similarly, there are other questions around annual income um, and other personal financial questions. You will see if you're asking these questions and if they are not strictly necessary, people will uh, jump out, uh, jump off. Um, you can see in this particular example, it does give some microcopy, which talks about what actually your annual income should be. It also um, is that it's a drop down menu with different brackets, which, again, we recommend because people don't. You know, they can't work out their exact income to the penny often. So giving them brackets is much better and reassures them. But again, what it's missing is why are you using this? And why do you need this information? What are you going to do with it? And typically for something like this, it's because you need to assess loan worthiness and credit worthiness and, and all those sort of things. So tell them why. Uh, so, yeah, if you're if you're asking anything that might scare someone off, always use microcopy. So. That's pretty much it for today. It's been a whistle stop tour, but these, as I say, are the, the big common things you will want to be looking at. So I think you know, make sure you go to your form and make sure you're you're looking out to see if those things are occurring. If you want to learn more about form optimization, form analytics, you can go to the Zico website. We've got a big section on guides. There's a couple of our or ebooks and white papers here on big book on form optimization and one specifically on how you use data to optimize your form. Amongst others, we, we have specialist uh, papers and blogs and articles that you can tap into. Uh, but of course, if you have any questions or any doubts or anything about forms in general, um, feel free to, to come through to me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn every day, so you can hit me up or you can email me at this address. Um, but I don't think we've got any questions that have come in. So we'll wind that up there. But thank you very much for your time today. Or if you're watching on playback, thanks for your time in the future. Uh, we'll be running a few more of these uh, shows. Uh, so we'll do that. But um, thanks for your time. And uh, any questions, do let me know.